The Roundtable joins me now here in Dallas, former North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and journalist and ABC News contributor Maria Elena Salinas. It's so great to see you all here this morning on this beautiful morning in <laughs> Dallas. So let's talk. Chris, let's talk first about that terrible, terrible attack on Paul Pelosi in his home. Threats against lawmakers have more than doubled since 2017, according to the Capitol Police. And, of course, we heard that the suspect was looking for the speaker herself with those terrible haunting cries of, where's Nancy? Yeah, look, this is awful stuff. And for all of us who have held public office, and, and, and especially for those of us who kind of spoke our mind, when we did it and didn't care about the ramifications, it's a different world than when I first came into office in 2010 uh, in terms of the concern about that. So I think, I think there's everybody feels the same way, that, you know, that's something that we just can't tolerate. And if we're in a different world now, which we are, I don't think there's any doubt given those numbers, we have to change the way we secure those folks. So if the speaker wasn't at her home but her husband was, the same way we're now protecting the families of Supreme Court justices, um, for the leadership in Congress, we're going to have to start thinking about protecting their families as well. And think about the, the burden and the way that's going to change their families' lives, too. Because having that omnipresent security, while it increases safety, it decreases your freedom and your liberty to do what you want to do with your life. And, and Heidi, what about the rhetoric? Well, I mean, it's got to calm down. It's got to slow down. But the other ramification of what's happening right now, Martha, is who's going to step up to run? Who's going to say, I'm going to subject my family to this kind of scrutiny and this kind of danger? And so we're not only affecting the lives of people today, we're affecting what's going to happen in the future in terms of recruiting great people to serve our country. And so it needs to calm down. We need to have a bipartisan commitment to cooling the rhetoric, stopping the language, calling out bad language when people like um, Marjorie Taylor Greene um, uh, say what she says. And, and we need people to understand that, that this is about policy. This isn't a civil war. And, and the closer we get to not containing this, the closer we get to um, continuing arms insurrection in this country. Maria Elena, do you really see anything changing with the rhetoric? Do you see it calming down? Actually, I, I don't. I mean, I, I do think the condemnations will continue and they should continue, but how long will they last? I mean, I think what we're seeing is sort of like the consequences of all this hate speech and of the deep divisions that we see in our, in, in our country. But, you know, we're so close to the election now, we're just a few days away. And, you know, we're hearing things like Governor Youngkin saying, yes, we really should have no room for crime and for violence. But at the same time, let's send Nancy back to California with her husband. And like, uh, like she referenced, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene saying treason is punishable by death and Nancy Pelosi is a traitor. So, you know, we are right now being bombarded with political ads at every turn in every platform. And most of them are attack ads. We don't see politicians telling us why they should we should vote for them, but rather talk bad about their opponents and how disastrous their opponent should be. So, yeah, these are dangerous times. And, you know, we have, what, nine days? I have lost nine count. days. Nine days to the election. Nine days, so, exactly. So, you know, you don't expect people to soften up in these last nine days. We'll, we'll hope they do a little bit. But nine days, nine days, and the subject is the economy everywhere I went. And you heard Rick talk about that. It's the economy that helps the Republicans. There was some good news this week. The U.S. economy grew in the third quarter. But is that really enough to help struggling Democrats? Yeah, what, what, what people don't experience is GDP. Um, what they do experience is high prices when they go to the gas station, insecurity when they go to the food to buy meat or produce, which has skyrocketed, and then all the language about what's going to happen with high heating prices. The Democrats missed an opportunity to talk about what they were going to do and what they did do on the economy. And I think you're going to see inflation curve. We're hearing now that the Fed may actually ratchet back some plans. But, you know, in some ways, this might be too little too late, Martha, um, uh, this push to really get an economic message out there. And, and Chris, also crime, the Republicans pushing crime. You've got crime, the economy. What, what are you seeing overall? Look, I think the economy overall is the biggest issue, as you said in your, in your piece. That's touching everywhere. I've, 
In, in the last couple of weeks, I've been everywhere from Oregon to Rhode Island, and, and you hear about inflation first and foremost from everybody. Um, crime is more localized in certain places. When I was campaigning in the Hudson Valley in New York for House candidates, crime was more important issue to them than inflation. But in Oregon, inflation was, e was even bigger despite some of the things that have happened in Portland. And in Oregon, homelessness um, is a huge issue there and one that's become the centerpiece of the, of, of the governor's race there. But think about this, and this it tells you what a difficult night November is going to be for the Democrats. Um, I was campaigning in Oregon and Rhode Island. Uh, we're going to win a House seat in Rhode Island for the first time in 40 years with Alan Fung. Lori Chavez de Remer could win a House seat in Oregon. I mean, you know, that's not places Pretty we were competing yeah. in 2020. So that tells you which way the wind's blowing. And, and Maria Elena, you heard Rick and me talking about the Latino vote. How much ground are Republicans gaining in the electorate with the Latinos? There's well, a know, change. Right. Uh, it, it changed in 2020. Uh, there's definitely a shift towards Republicans, but mainly in South Texas and South Florida, uh, to a much lesser extent in the rest of the country. We have to remember that Latinos are not a man monolith, not culturally, not politically. So there are different reasons. In South Florida, of course, it was the anti-socialist message that resonated not only with Cuban Americans, but also with Venezuelans and Central Americans and, and those migrants that came from authoritarian governments. But, in, you know, in general, I think you, Democrats still have more support than Republicans. I think we will have to wait and see until November 8th to see if that is going to stick or not. Now, those same issues that resonated in 2020 are also issues. Here in South Texas, immigration. And immigration, because we have to remember that there's a very strong Border Patrol presence in, in, in south, south of Texas, about 240,000 Border Patrol agents, half of them are Hispanic, so they do have a lot of support. It is their livelihood. And Chris, Donald Trump, let's talk about Donald Trump. He's making the rounds in battleground states. He's going to Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, but not Georgia very early before the primaries. And yeah. he's not rallying for Governor DeSantos to be reelected in Florida. What's going on here? Well, this is this is shocking. <laughs> Donald Trump is acting in his own self-interest as opposed to acting in the interest of the party. Um, again, this is what I've been talking about for months now. The Republicans are going to have to make a fundamental judgment after November 8th. Are we the party of me or are we the party of us? And Donald Trump represents the party of me. Now, you know, when you see how he's making those choices, you understand that it's all about him. If you've said nice things about him, if you agree that the election was stolen, he'll campaign for you. If you don't, he won't. I was with Joe O'Day, the Senate candidate in Colorado who you interviewed. He eviscerates Joe O'Day because he said Joe Biden is the legitimate president, um, despite the fact that Joe O'Day agrees on issues with Donald Trump predominantly. So this is not about issues. Once again, it's about person and it's about Donald Trump and his own selfish desire um, to want his own point of view of the world, especially about the 2020 election, reaffirmed. And if you don't reaffirm it, which Ron DeSantis hasn't, interestingly, you know, that's why he's not in Florida with Ron DeSantis. I do want to get back to the issues first. Let's go back to the issue of abortion. The blue wave that was initially predicted after Roe was overturned has really seemed to subside. Heidi, but with more states limiting rights, can Democrats get people to rally around that? Well, you forget that in Kansas, um, the measure that would have outlawed abortion was winning by over four points and then eventually lost by almost uh, that many, if not more. And so there is a undertone of human rights and what does this mean for us? It, obviously, the Democratic base heavily uh, gender biased towards women. And I think women have not forgotten that reproductive rights are on the agenda. And I think it'll matter in some legislative races, House races. But I think it's also going to matter in some uh, uh, of our Senate races. And so we'll wait and see. But don't don't assume just because you saw those numbers about it's not as important as the economy, that it's not an important voting issue. It is. And, and Chris, it is. It's number three in the polls. And, and you've also got 62 percent saying it should be legal in all or most cases. How do Republicans square that? I, I don't think they square it. And I don't think that it matters. I mean, I, look, yeah, it's it's the third issue, but it's three and a half times less important than the economy in this race. And I think the Democrats have made a serious strategic error. Remember, too, um, the intensity of voters matters in a midterm election. 
And I've seen a number of polls where the intensity of the pro-life side of this is higher than the intensity of the, the pro-choice side of it. In the end, look, I think people who are voting that as their number one issue had their jerseys on a long time ago, Martha. They were voting Democrat if they're pro-choice, they're voting Republican if they're pro-life. And the folks that the vast number of folks in the middle um, where that issue is not their number one issue, um, they're making this decision based on the economy and crime, education, uh, drug abuse and drug overdoses. Those are the things that are affecting them much more in their neighborhood every day. And so I think the, the Democrats who made this a centerpiece, and as I've been traveling around, I've seen a lot of ads about this from Democratic candidates, I think uh, are going to look back on it and say they should have come up with a different strategy. And, and Maria Elena, let, let's look at immigration. It, it, it is not just an issue in a border state like here in Texas. This is really spread across the country. How big of an issue do you think this is? It is. It is an issue in Texas and also in Arizona, but to a different, with different views. Uh, there's some people that are concerned about the border and they want immigration to stop. But to the majority of Latino voters, for example, one of the most important things is immigration reform. And it's very, very difficult, very complicated to have immigration reform. Both uh, administrations from both parties have attempted to do so in the past, and they have not been able to do that. So what do voters, what would voters like to see? Well, there's a sector that would like to see control in the border. And that is very, very complicated. As long as you have poor countries with very complicated political issues, at home, they're always going to try to come for a better life. I think the issue has been taken out of proportion. All these busing of immigrants into these cities and then treating them as if they're invaders. And we forget that those people who are here who have crossed the border are asylum seekers and that they have the legal right to request asylum, that they have the that we as a country have the legal authority and the, and the legal obligation to at least listen to their case. But what's really needed is immigration reform, and that's what they want, that leads to some kind of legalization for the dreamers and for the 11 million undocumented immigrants. And Chris, what will they get if Republicans take charge? What about that wall? Well, well look, I, you know, the, the problem here is, and, and, and this is where I disagree with Maria a little bit, is that, you know, Democratic politicians in Northeastern states and in the far west have been able to declare themselves sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, sanctuary states with no ramifications for that. They, they grandstand it for political purposes and then there are no ramifications for it. Now that you have folks who are saying, okay, if you're a sanctuary state, New York, you're a sanctuary city, New York City, we're gonna send folks up there. Um, and, and you say that's what you wanted, you wanna be a sanctuary. You know, I think that this is a problem for politicians of both parties. When you can say things without ramifications, you know, they do it. When the ramifications come home to roost, and you've seen this on disaster aid, Governor DeSantis voted against disaster aid for Sandy, which happened 10 years ago yesterday in my state. But when the, the hurricane comes to the Gulf Coast of Florida, he wants that aid from the federal government. He wants it right away. When you're a congressman, you can grandstand and it doesn't matter. When you're a governor and you have to look into the eyes of misery and loss, you want that help right away. And I think it's the same thing on this. You say a sanctuary state, but don't send anybody here. I, I, I think immigration is really complicated, but you can't separate it from the economy. You grow the economy when you have more people being productive. Right now, one of the reasons why inflation is up is because we don't have a workforce that can fill the number of jobs that we have. And that reduces productivity. It increases wages, which is a good thing. But we've got to have more workers. And so you can't. This is an issue that is conflated with the economic issues. And ironically, the Koch brothers have been some of the the biggest proponents of immigration reform. You know, this is a right-left issue that merges in some ways as people look at um, a, a greater opportunity for a, big, a bigger and more productive workforce. And, and, and Heidi, I want to stay with you for a minute. I, I, I want to ask you, this, we've said this could be one of the most consequential yeah. elections. If Republicans take over, that is a huge change. And I want to ask you the same question I asked Rick Scott about the election deniers. Nearly 200, with 67% of those, will probably get in. How does the country change? Yeah, I, I think there's election deniers who are true believers. They believe whatever is told them about mules or, or ballots. And then there's election deniers who are opportunists. 
right? They're saying it because they want the Donald Trump endorsement. I think the consequences... And yet that validates right, the right. people who no, believe I, it. I, I agree. I agree. And, and the problem that you have with this election, and I've been preaching this every place that I've gone, this is just the second chapter of 2020 on whether we take back the country and have some semblance of normalcy in terms of addressing our policy issues. If Donald Trump elects his slate of candidates... The Republican Party will be cemented for a decade as a Donald Trump party. And that is bad for this country because he's the most divisive figure that has ever sat in the, the president's chair. Look, I, I don't buy much of what Heidi just said in terms of what it does to the party going forward. Donald Trump's not on the ballot this time. Um, that changes the dynamic of a lot of these races. And secondly, 24 will come when 24 comes. And Donald Trump's either going to be a part of it or he's not. And, and that's when people will start to make those fundamental decisions about what kind of leadership they want in the Oval Office and what kind they'll reject. And I don't think we're anywhere near making that call yet. I, uh, Maria Lynn, I, I, we're, we're running out of time here. And I want to quickly, speaking of Donald Trump, Elon Musk now owns Twitter. Do you expect Donald Trump to be back on there? And how much <laughs> difference will that make? Well, let's see how long it lasts. He says he'd rather be in Truth Social, but he has much uh, less followers in Truth Social than he does in Twitter. Uh, but, you know, um, Elon Musk has been talking a lot about, yeah, let's free the bird. But he, he paused almost immediately saying, no, we're going to have a content moderation panel before we make any changes. And he's already lost the General Motors. And he, I'm sure he doesn't want to lose more. You're dying to say Should something Trump, about Trump, 10 seconds. Trump won't be back on Twitter because he can't make money there. He's trying to make money on True Social. He'll stay where he can try to make money. Every outrageous thing that Trump says is already on Twitter. Let's admit it, right? So it's like, they he's are. on Twitter? No, he's not. He's got they an are. Doing All right. him anyway. Thanks to all of you. Great to have you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.